You know, isn't it one of those Christian things we do is when we want to say something, we say you or us or we, instead of just saying a knucklehead like me. That's what he meant to say. Just say it, pastor. We understand. Well, hi, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to continue through a series we began last week. I uh, ask you if you have your Bibles or if you need to fire up a device, Matthew 25 is going to be our launching point. Uh, message today is dealing with poverty. We've been talking about this thought of help wanted, that God has called us to engage in the world around us, that that's really his great commission. That's his call for us, that yes, the church is a vehicle for us to be equipped, to be encouraged, and to be challenged, but the ultimate win, the ultimate goal, as we like to say here at Impact, is to live and to love like Jesus. Uh, so that the world begins to be introduced to uh, the relationship that they can have with God through Christ as well. And, and as we tackle some of these uh, topics, uh, that's what's really facing us in the world today, isn't it? Um, poverty is something that is definitely prevalent in our world. And when we think about a lot of the things that God has called us to as Christians, there's a reason that they say a lot of things are black and white, that there is not really gray area. And what I mean by that is a lot of things first hit our ears as Christians and you're like, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. Count it joy when you go through various trials. Oh yeah, I'm always happy camper when that happens, God. But he begins to help us to understand that he's working in us through those things. Uh, another one that we read in the book of Acts is that it's more blessed to give than to receive. How many get a little lump in your throat when you try to swallow that one? I mean, as kids, we've been taught that, hey, get, get, and get more, right? Uh, you know, we want people to give us stuff. It's nice to receive, but God begins to flip some of these concepts upside down and helps us to understand the real wiring that we have within us is that we're wired to be generous. We're wired to be givers. We're wired to be used by God for his purpose in our life. And we see that when it comes to poverty. Uh, it's one of those things that I think most of us are aware of, but have we engaged in the process to be able to make a difference and to see change come about in the world around us? You know, when I think about the way God presents a lot of these concepts, I, I think about when I was young and when I was raising my children when they were young. Anybody else ever have this where it's like, it's good food, you know they're going to like it, but they won't come close to it. Anybody ever, ever get this? It's like, I, I had this with my second oldest, and this was probably the, the most glaring example, is, is he loved pizza, we did as a family. And, and one evening, my wife uh, prepared spaghetti. And we're like, oh, this is going to be great, the kids are going to love it, they love pizza. And my second oldest, Curtis, looked at it and said, I hate spaghetti. And, you know, we're thinking logically as parents, like, okay, well, let's explain this to them logically, right? I mean, uh, son, the, the sauce that's in the spaghetti is the exact sauce that's on the pizza. Uh, it's going to taste exactly the same, a little different texture, but it's the same stuff. We're not going to give you something that you're going to not enjoy and not like, but he would not even come close to it. I, I say that because I think a lot of times when we hear some of the challenges that God puts before us, we have the same thought, we have the same pushback. And then we experience those things and we're like, oh yeah. Uh, just to let you know the end of the story, yes, Curtis does like spaghetti now. Uh, he, <laughs> he tasted and saw that the spaghetti was good. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and it's the same thing for us in our spiritual journey. We're challenged, it says in the Bible, to taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and often we just try to rationalize and think through these thoughts and they're like, I, I don't know if I want to get close to that. I say that to encourage us on the heels of what Pastor Ryan taught us last week, and that is in this series, we will be challenged. In this series, thinking about engaging in the world around us with its many difficulties and challenges. Uh, it, it's easy to just push back and say, well, I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post something on Facebook or I'll let you know my opinion on those things, but we don't want to really dive in to the problem because we don't see the joy in engaging in that process. But as Pastor Ryan shared with us last week, God has put these things in our life not to torture us, not to burden us, but to bless us. It doesn't say it's more of a burden to give than to receive. It says you will be more blessed to give than to receive. 
And we need to be able to put our trust in our heavenly father to say, God, I, I want to engage. I want to taste and see that these things are good. So in saying that, uh, in Matthew chapter 25, is kind of a, a talking point that Jesus gives to all of us and gives to his early disciples about helping people that are in need. But first of all, to set the stage, when we think about poverty, I think most of us don't really need a lesson to say that poverty is a problem. That there is a lot of people who are impoverished in the world around us. Just to give you guys some statistics to be able to set the stage, in the United States alone, there's almost 40 million people today that live below the poverty line uh, in the United States alone. Uh, that works out to be some almost 13% and about one in eight people. Uh, so, I mean, you get a group of, of eight people, there's one person in that group that more than likely statistics will tell you is struggling with poverty. In the world around us, it gets even greater because there's obviously more people. Uh, some 80 or 800 million people are impoverished in the world around us. They say in the world around us that there are many people, some uh, almost 800,000 people or 800 million people that are dealing with an income of a dollar and 90 cents per day to live on. And, and, and I get that and, and I understand that there's different costs of living around the world, but still that's not a whole lot to be able to feed yourself or your family, to be able to find shelter and all of these kinds of things. It's a problem, people. And I think most of us would acknowledge that and shake our heads and say, absolutely, I've seen it firsthand. Many of us, even in our own community, have seen it. Some of us have launched out into other communities in the United States, other states, and seen it. Some of us have been to even the third world, and you've seen it firsthand, and you're like, wow, there is a problem in our world when it comes to poverty. But what is the solution? I want you guys to Go along with me here in Matthew 25. First, I want to set the stage because here's what's going on in the context of the scripture. You see, it's called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, for you Bible students, you guys understand. If not, let me explain it to you. The Olivet Discourse was this conversation, this discourse that Jesus had with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And to break it down in simple terms, here's kind of the way it goes down. Jesus and his disciples are in the city of Jerusalem doing different things, taking care of various tasks, ministering to people's needs. And so they come out of the city and they come up on this hill that kind of overlooks the city called the Mount of Olives. Jesus now takes the occasion to share this truth with his disciples about the world around them. To me, here's kind of the picture that I see. It's like they're kind of up on this hill. You can see in the distance the city. And it's almost like Jesus is kind of telling his disciples, hey boys, you remember everything that we just saw? You, you see in the distance that great city that we call our holy city? Let me tell you some truths about some of the things that we just saw. Let me help to remind you of our role when it comes to even some of those people we've seen that are in need. Some of those people who are struggling. Some of the people maybe that we even saw begging on those same streets that we just walked through. He's helping them to understand his role and their role in this life. You see, when we think about Jesus, when he challenges people, he challenges them in their relationship. You see, a lot of times we look around and it's like, well, what are you doing? And, and hey, we need to be active and we need to be doing certain things. But really, the main question shouldn't be what we're doing. It should be, who are we deep within? You see, Jesus is talking to them about relationship here. And I'm going to skip forward, but I'm going to give you the context. He talks to them about a great judgment that's about to come. He shares with them, this is three days before he's going to go to the cross. He knows his end here on earth is about to come. But he also knows that there will be a second coming. And he now talks about that second coming and he talks about it in a separation of those who have a relationship with God and those who do not have a relationship with God. He calls those with a relationship with God sheep. He calls those without goats. So let me read it to you and we'll break it down. Starting in verse 35. He says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I mean, think about all of these things are things that we would respond to in a relationship with someone, right? If we had a close relationship with someone and we heard that they were in the hospital, we would visit them. 
If we heard that they were in need of food and clothing, we would do everything in our power to be able to help to fulfill that need. And Jesus is saying, hey, you guys say you love me. We're hanging out. You're my disciples. You guys, in our relationship, I want to tell you, you did these things for me. When I was in need, you fulfilled that need. And now it says in verse 37, then the righteous will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? They're like, I, 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 I don't remember. Where's the, what's the connection here? I mean, I get what you're saying that we would respond, obviously, because we love you. We would respond to these things, these needs that you would have. But I don't remember ever that happening. And he says this, the king will answer them, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of my brothers, you have done it to me or did it to me. You see, he's helping them to understand their role in the world is to check out and look for the least of those, the people that are in need, those people that need to be visited, those people that need clothing, those people that need food when they're hungry. And he says, that's a representation of our relationship. As you respond to that relationship, you'll take care of these people. And it wasn't anything new to the nation of Israel. You know, even in the Old Testament, we read even in the book of Leviticus, where they're challenged to be able to look out for those people who were poor. Those people who were dealing with poverty firsthand. It literally says when they would take and they would glean from their fields, when it would be harvest time, that they were supposed to leave the corners of the field alone. And the purpose behind that is, is that God wanted to, a way for them to set out for those that were impoverished to go and to get that grain, get the stuff that they needed around the edges of the fields to be able to nourish themselves. You see, God's heart is for those that are in need. Just like we responded to a need that we had, whether it was spiritual, maybe whether it was emotional, maybe you were dealing with addiction, maybe you were dealing with whatever condition, God met you where you were. He has a heart for those that are in need. And he's saying, in this relationship that we now have, my question to you is, do you respond as well? You know, as I shared before, one of the things that we like to mention from time to time around here is what we feel God has called us to be as a church. First of all, it's to be those that have an impact. And how do we have an impact? It's to live and to love like Jesus to show the world the heart that Jesus has for them. And that's really our calling, is to be able to respond to the needs that we see and say, I, I want to do something about that. You know, we do that as a church, and I want to spend just a moment helping you to understand, as a church body, some of the things even in this last year that we've been a part of as a group, as a church family. Number one, you may have heard of impact hunger. Impact Hunger is a food collection we do once a month. Just to give you guys some perspective, this last year in 2018, over 5,000 pounds were donated to Impact Hunger to give to our food cupboard here in Menifee. You guys can give yourself a hand. That's pretty awesome. I mean, more than, more than two and a half tons of food. That's a lot of food. But, but that's something that we, I think, recognize as a group. Hey, this is something that we need to be a part of. Not only that, some of you might know, maybe some of you don't, but we also have another thing here at the church that's called the Impact One Fund. What Impact One is, is that each and every Sunday where we take an offering, every loose dollar bill that's in that offering does not go to our general fund to pay for the facility, to pay for all the church stuff. It goes into a benevolence account that goes specifically to be able to reach out to anybody who's in need in our community that reaches out to the church and says, I'm having a hard time financially. Can you assist? Over $2,000 this year came in. That's a lot of $1 bills, people. And you guys did that. We respond as a church family. Amazing. Even this last Christmas, you guys may have participated in what we called impact care packages. 180 care packages that you guys picked up the boxes, filled them up with needs that would be able to help those that were homeless in our community. And then we went and distributed those things. Uh, one of the ministries that we partnered with that helped us to distribute many of those items was a ministry called Hope Sack Ministries. And to be able to give us kind of a firsthand perspective on dealing with people that are impoverished and what God has done in our heart to be able to meet that need, 
I'm going to invite up Lyle Coleman. Some of you guys know Lyle. He has this ministry called Hope Sack Ministries. And I'm going to ask him just to kind of share just a little bit so maybe we can get a little behind the scenes look at what God has done in his life as an encouragement and maybe a challenge for us. So starting off, give us kind of a little bit of your background. How do you get into a, a crazy ministry like feeding homeless people on the streets by yourself? Um, well, first of all, I was uh, addicted to drugs as a child and uh, I did drugs for like 23 years of my life and um, I did meth for like 18 years and uh, to get over alcohol, I went into a Christian men's home called New Creations and uh, committed myself to a year there. And uh, in there, you know, God started working on my heart and changing my heart. And um, we run a car wash there, and I would see homeless people there walking around. And so one of the things I did was started giving away my sandwich every day, and uh, it became like an everyday thing. And then once I came home, uh, the need's still there everywhere, you know. And I, work at a, I worked at a car wash here in Menifee, so I started, you know, buying people lunch and, you know, praying with people. And the church had uh, loose Bibles here from when they merged and became Impact, and uh, they blessed me with those. So I started handing them out, you know, just on foot. I didn't even have a car. And then uh, once I got my car, I started filling up the trunk and then uh, just praying about it. It kept growing. And then uh, so instead of giving cash, I just started going to 99 cent store and buying, you know, deodorant, toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, like 10, 15 at a time, and then just buying food. and. Um, what I do is I just roll around and uh, anybody I see, I just ask if they want water and that breaks the ice. I get them to my car and uh, they can basically shop out of the trunk of my car. Um, I provide for their needs there. I pray with them. I offer them to go to the same home I went to and uh, it's just been growing. And now the church has been, you know, people have been donating and uh, I've been able to really get out there. I've been doing it for about three years now. And uh, yeah, so that's how it all started. Awesome. Good stuff. You know, first of all, I always wanted to be a cool kid. And you use like some of that terminology. Like last service, he said, he said, when I'm dipping in the hood. <laughs> this one, he said, you know, when I'm rolling around, you know, just like the rest of us talk. I love it. Um, but we would love to, to be rolling in the hood with you for just a moment. So if you can, maybe share just kind of a behind the scenes story that you could uh, maybe share with us that you were ministering to someone that really touched your heart. So um, I, I live in Hemet, and uh, for those of you who know, it's pretty bad over there, and I live off of Florida Avenue, and uh, I know a lot of the people there. I built relationships with them, and uh, I was going home one night, and there's this guy named Chainsaw that I know, and uh, he was sitting on the bus stop, and uh, I was going to pass him by. You know, I, I see him all the time, and, uh, you know, so I'm like, what a jerk, you know, so I turned around, I went back, and uh, he didn't have a jacket, and he was cold, and it was like 11 o'clock, I think, so... Um, I had a sweater at my house, so I'm like, you know, let me run home. I'll get a sweater for you. And he's like, do you have socks? So I'm like, okay. So I went home. I got one of my sweaters and some, some of my socks, and I brought it to him. And, uh, you know, I have food and water in my trunk all the time. And so I'm sitting there about to pray with him, and then uh, I hand him the socks, and he goes to put them on, but he has no shoes. And I'm like, he's on crutches. His leg is messed up. It's bleeding. It's all swollen. It was, like, really bad. And so... I have shoes at my house, and for those of you that know me, I'm kind of crazy with my shoes, and I keep them super clean, and uh, I have like five pairs, and so I'm like, I got shoes at the house, I'm like, please don't say you wear size 12, you know, so, <laughs> so, and I'm seriously, I'm thinking that in my head, and then he's like, I wear size 12, and I'm like, oh my gosh, so, <laughs> I drove back home, and I got my shoes, and I brought them to him, and then um, I, I was just going to give them to him, and he can't even bend over to put them on, and so I had to, you know, humble myself and get down, and change his socks and put his shoes on for him. And, uh, you know, I've just seen him yesterday and, uh, you know, he's super grateful. And uh, it's, it's all about just building relationships with them. And it's not if they're going to change today. It doesn't matter. Uh, it took me a long time. You know, it took me many years. And it's all about being obedient to what God's called us to do. You know, John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you is that you love one another as I have loved you. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment, you know, that we need to be out there doing it. So that's all I'm doing. I'm not doing it because I want to be seen. I'm not doing it because I want praise. I'm doing it because Jesus pulled me out of the gutter and he cleaned me up. And he wants me to go out and show people that there's hope in Christ, that he can clean them up too, you know. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand, huh? Amazing to see what God wants to do in each one of our lives. And that's just an example 
Um, and it really kind of brings me to the, the next thought that I want to communicate to you this morning. And, and that is that we are not called to just pity people who have need. You know, we look at poverty and I think we all understand it's a problem. And so we feel sorry for people and we're like, wow, that's really a shame. And when we understand the biblical command, as Lyle said, that we have, it's not to just feel sorry for people, but it's to respond with action. You know, there's a huge difference. And I think a lot of us kind of lump these two words together. And that is the word pity and the word compassion. You see, in the Bible, the word compassion means literally to see a need, to be moved by that need, and then to respond in any way possible that you can be able to help to meet that need. We see it in the life of Jesus Christ. You may have read in the Gospels where Jesus may be even looking out at the crowd there at the triumphal entry. It says that he was moved with compassion because he realized the people were lost and wandering that they were weary and troubled in this life because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You see, he was moved to do something, and that's why Jesus would begin to explain and teach about the truths. It also tell you that Jesus would look out on the crowd and see many were sick and needed healing, and he would get down on his hands and knees and begin to heal those people. You see, he didn't just look out there and say, man, I really, my heart goes out for those types of people. You see, the word compassion in the Bible is in the Greek language a word that, that you have to tighten your diaphragm to be able to say, splachnizimai, splachnizimai. And there's a reason that they use that because they realized even by saying that and expressing it, it was something that tightened up their stomach. It's talking about the intestines being moved. We might call it gut-wrenching. Or, or, you know, I don't want to get too gross, but anybody else have been at that place where you're like, I have to use the restroom and I have to use it right now, right? We've all been there. And not to get too graphic, but you don't, you don't mess around. It's not like you're like, oh, you know what? I really got to go. You're like, I have to go. Where's the nearest restroom? I don't care if it's an outhouse. I don't care if it's a gas station. I don't care if it's clean or not at this point. I just need something, right? That's the same word. And, and I wonder when we see needs like that in our world, if we're moved that way. Or if it's kind of like, yeah, one of these days I'll get around to it. Yeah, that was really cool. You know, I mean, I, I, I pray for Lyle and his ministry. Awesome. That's great. But the question is, what are we doing as individuals to be able to meet those needs that we see with our own two eyes in the world around us? You know, way too often I think we like to make excuses, not just as Christians, but as human beings. And, and we bring it into our Christian experience and we just push away these things, even as Lyle said, the commandments or the commission. When Jesus left his disciples would ascend to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, he said, go and make disciples of many nations. Go into all of the nations and preach the gospel. Let them know that there's good news for them. And we see all these things, but they're not suggestions. These are things that God has put before us, and yet so often we want to dismiss them and just say, well, no, right now is not really the right time. And here's one of my pet peeves since I've become a Christian, is in Christianity, we just try to clean it up by using some spiritual terms to be able to make an excuse that makes us sound a little bit more spiritual, but it's still not responding the way God wants us to respond. And saying that, I saw this on the internet. I thought you guys would get a kick out of it. So let's take a look at this together. Some of you guys know John Chris. Okay, ways to say no. There are a bunch of them. No thanks. I'm good. I'll pass. One of my personal favorites. For sure no. I don't know if you knew this or not, but when you got saved, you got eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and access to a whole long list of ways to say no that'll make you sound like way more spiritual of a person than you actually are. I don't think it's God's will. It's just not his timing. I'm feeling led in a different direction. But let me talk to my pastor about that. It's a closed door. I'm waiting on the Lord right now. I just don't feel peace about it right now. God has a different assignment for me. I just didn't feel prompted. I just don't 
don't feel like that's something that Jesus would do. But I just feel like I'm not in that season anymore. Can you help me move this weekend? But normally I would, but I just feel like God is just telling me to rest right now. I just got a sense that it didn't line up. Right now I'm in a season of new wineskins. What does that even mean? I just feel like right now I'm in a season of creating margin and I just don't have the bandwidth. Are you even speaking English right now? I was just asking if you wanted to get a pizza. Prompting. How many times have I told you about the prompting? I'm not feeling the prompting. I don't know. I'm just not really feeling the spirits leading on this one. Mm, you know what? I'm not sure. Let me lay out a fleece on that one. <laughs> okay, I don't think anyone says that. And of course, everybody's all-time favorite, let me pray about it. All I'm saying is when it comes to Christian ways of saying no, just say no. Aren't the funniest things in life the things that hit close to home? It's funny because I think most of us, if we were honest with ourselves, would say we've used some of those things from time to time. And he even talks about the one that I know I've used often, and that is, let me pray about it. And when I think about, you know, the last statements that I made before we watch that video is there's certain things in God's word that he's laid out as directions for us. We don't have to pray about going out and helping the needy. That's something that we should just do in response to who God has made us, what God has done on the inside of us. I mean, does anybody read anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus and his disciples are walking around and they looked out at the great crowd who was in great need and Jesus said, let's have a prayer. Jesus said, let's go do something. We need to respond to this. And I'm not in any way, shape, or form putting down prayer because it is a powerful weapon against the enemy. But we also need to not use it as an excuse and use it properly. To be able to just use it as an excuse instead of really saying what was in our heart and that is, I really don't want to tell you no right now, but it's really uncomfortable to say that to you face to face. So how about this one? Let me pray about it. That's what we do as Christians. We make all these excuses instead of responding to who God has called us to be. And I think it's important for us to understand this truth. You know, it's, it's wonderful to come to church and to be challenged to repair and to fix those things that we're doing wrong that we know are things that God doesn't want as a part of our life. Those are the sins that we deal with, whether it's addiction, whether it's lust, wherever it is, all of us deal at some levels with some of these things and we're like, you know, yeah, I need to be careful. I need to make sure that I guard myself. I need to make sure that I, I'm aware that those are things God doesn't want as a part of my life. They're, they're gonna lead me to death and destruction and I need to avoid those things. But you know that the Bible tells us that there's actually two forms of sin. There's a form of that's called the sins of commission. A sin of commission is those things that you should not be doing, but you're doing willingly. Those things that we need to avoid. But there's also an area that's called the sins of omission. Those are things that we've omitted from our life. Put it that way in your mind. And those are things that God has put before us that we should be doing. These are the good deeds that are before us, but yet we are not participating in them. And, and I would be a bad pastor to just get up here every Sunday and tell you guys, you need to deal with the bad things you're doing and avoid those things without telling you, you also need to engage in the good things that are before you. God sees two sides to this coin. And often we want to focus on all the bad things we do. and We need to clean our, our act up and we need to be better. And all those things are true. But the other side of it is, you know what? We need to be participating in some of the things that God has put before us. You ever read this scripture and found in uh, Romans chapter 7 where Paul makes the statement about his struggle. And we all have this same struggle in our flesh. And he says, hey, the good things that I want to do, I do not do. And those bad things in which I do not want to do, I find myself doing them. Anybody familiar with this scripture? And what do we usually land on as a Christian? Hey, yeah, I do that too. I mess up. Think about the first statement that he said. Hey, there's some good things that are out there and I'm not doing them. I'm not responding the way God wants me to respond. This is Paul the Apostle. I mean, he shows all of us up in this room combined. But this is a guy who realized, you know what, there are things that God has put in my life that I need to, to take advantage of, that I need to respond to properly so that I can be hitting the target of God's purpose and plan for my life. The question is, is what is our excuse this morning? And I know in my mind, I wrestle probably with many of the same things you guys do. One of the first things that comes to my heart is, wow, that's a big world that's out there. There's a lot of people that are impoverished. How can I make any difference? I read statistics like that. There's 800 million people in our world that are impoverished. And you're thinking, what is little old me going to do about that? 
Reminds me of a story may you have heard of. It's an old, probably 30, 40 year old story, but man, it hits home to me. And it's called Starfish. The story goes this way. There was a man who had made it his ritual every morning to go down to the beach. He was a writer and that's where he found solitude and peace. And he was there after a storm one morning. And he noticed that thousands upon thousands of starfish had washed up on shore. As he looked down the beach, he was overwhelmed by just seeing how many of these had been washed up on shore. And then in the distance, he saw a little boy. And so he made his way over there to have a conversation. And he noticed that the little boy had been bending down and throwing some of these starfish into the ocean. He walked up to him as a skeptic would be and said, son, I, that, that's great what you're doing, but you will never make a difference. You can't help all of these starfish. And he pointed to all of the starfish that were on the shore. And the little boy once again bent down, grabbed a starfish, flicked it as far as he could into the ocean. He said, but I can help that one. And he bent down and grabbed another one and flinged it as far as he could. And he said, and I helped that one. You see, that's the mentality that we all have to have. Instead of being overwhelmed by the volume that we see in our world, we need to say, God, what can I do? What can I do? I could help that one. Reminds me of a quote I read this week by Paul Shane Spear, who writes this, the same thought. Helping one person might not change the whole world, but it might change the, wor the whole world for that one person. W who's the, the starfish in our life? Who's that one person that God maybe has before us? Who's the person maybe at work that we know God has been pulling us toward to encourage or to pray for or to share with? Who is maybe that homeless person that you continue to drive by day after day after day and you keep saying, I'll pray for him. That's great. I'm sure he needs your prayer. I'm sure she needs your prayer, but she probably needs other things as well. When we think about demonstrating the love of Christ, Jesus continued to share with his disciples that they were to be a light through the love that they displayed to the world around them. And this wasn't a new idea. This was an idea that was presented even at the beginning of a relationship that God had with Israel and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. When he said, you will be a light to the rest of the Gentile world. You see, he wanted to even use them to illuminate his goodness to the world around them where they would say, we need a God like that. We need a relationship with the creator of the universe. And it's a call that Jesus again gave to us as his disciples that we are to be the light of the world. Not to be hidden, but to be out there where people understand the heart of Jesus Christ. You see, being a Christian isn't always telling people what we're against. Being a Christian often is just letting them know how good God is. I mean, we've got to stop with all of the battles and the fights and all of those things and put them in their proper context. At times, we need to stand up and defend the truth. But that can't be our only focus. We need to be true disciples who go out there and say, that person's in need. Let me go talk to him and see how I can help. I mean, I'd I, I love having Lyle up here and, and hearing his story, but so often in church, what do we do with people like that? We have missionaries, we have pastors who share stories, and we become part of their fan club, and we become the cheerleading section at the football game. Go, Lyle, go! L, Y, right? <laughs> and we do this whole thing. But th that's not what Lyle needs. Lyle needs our support. He, he needs us to be able to encourage him, but he needs people to come alongside of him. Not only that, we need to be participating on a personal level. I, I shared these things for a reason that we do as a church body because I think they're amazing. And as a church body, we're doing amazing things. But how about when we leave this church body and we become just individuals day to day, going in different spheres of influence, going to this place and going over here and you're in this company and you're over here at this school and you're over here doing this and you're the housewife in the neighborhood. What are we doing as individuals? You see, it shouldn't always have to be church generated when we go and be used by God. It's not like I should say, you know what? I, I really feel the, the need to help people that are impoverished. And, and, and you know, I, I've, I've seen a lot of people that really could use some help. You know what? I'm just going to hope the, the church starts a ministry soon. What if the church doesn't start a ministry? 
Should we all sit on our hands and say, well, you know, the church doesn't have anything at that church. How about you start it? How about you just go do what you can do as an individual? Can you imagine the world around us? Can you imagine the community that we live on in if each and every one of us in this room today went out and did what Jesus called us to do? It would be revolutionary. It would change our world. And people would begin to see God's heart through our heart. You see, we gotta quit making excuses. We gotta quit with the, I'll pray about it. And hey, God hasn't put that on my heart. And it's just not the right season and all of these things. And just respond. Be who God has called us to be. You know, I, I think about not only responding, but responding properly. Because sometimes we can do things to alleviate a little bit of that maybe conviction that we're feeling as Christians to do things. Throw a little money at this or do something. Yeah, no, I, I do that. And here's exactly what I mean when it comes to giving people things that they need. Specifically, we see here that it's talked about clothing people. It's talking about feeding people. It's talking about meeting poverty where it's at. Often we can do things like, hey, I, I, I love what Lyle does. But often we can just dismiss it by giving not our best, maybe not even our second best, but giving something we no longer even want. Anybody else ever do this? The church has a shoe drive and you're like, oh, you know, let me go in the closet. Is there any shoe? Oh yeah, I got these shoes I can give them. I, I don't need, these are my paint shoes. But that's what we do as people, right? Oh, let's do some spring cleaning, honey. And, and we'll give all of the clothes to, you know, one of the missionaries. That's great. But what's really the heart behind that? I need to clear some more space because I want some new stuff. I got some stuff I've been eyeing. I, I got to tell you, you know, processing this message, as I always do, sharing a little bits and pieces and, and uh, just getting my wife's input. She shared this with me when I shared kind of the challenge that I was going to put out there today. She was like, well, I mean, if you had to give your shoes away, what, what shoes would you give? And I said, well, I was thinking about giving away my, my black boots. And she busted me. As the Holy Spirit that works through our spouses, amen. Don't you guys hate when that happens? Holy mackerel, I hate when that happens. She said, I, I noticed you've been on Amazon and a couple of these companies looking for new boots. Is that why you want to get rid of the old ones? Maybe. Why well, you got to be like that. And hit me with the truth, right? But, but here's what I mean by that. I mean, the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And yet when it comes to needs, sometimes I think we want to be able to take down some of the pressure that we feel, that we really want to be who God has called us to be. And so we just throw stuff out that's really not our best at all. I mean, what would it look like if instead of giving the homeless people our worn, torn out trash, we gave them our good stuff. We gave them our good shoes. We gave them our best jacket. We gave them the stuff that they would get and go, wow, this, I, I've never received anything like this. This is amazing. You know, when I had been a Christian just a couple of years, I started helping out at the church, just cleaning up in general, just going down and doing some janitorial and, and cleaning up the classrooms. And I'll never forget, about 30 years ago now, we had a little small church and our vacuum cleaner had broke. And so, you know, talking to the pastor, hey, the vacuum cleaner's not working. He's like, well, we just don't have a budget to buy a new vacuum cleaner right now. So this next Sunday, I'm gonna make a, a plea to the congregation and ask them, hey, does anybody have a vacuum cleaner? The church is in need of one. Sounds great, right? Well, here's the good news. That next week, we got three vacuum cleaners. The bad news, none of them worked. None of them worked. And that's just a reflection because I'm just as guilty as anybody else of doing the exact same thing. We see a need. We know that God's prompting us to meet that need. But instead of giving it our best and giving it our all, we give it our second best at best. I wonder what it would look like if we did things the way God has called us and we responded the way God has called us to respond. I want to close by giving you a challenge in a couple of different areas. And I know this is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a serious challenge. 
Number one is probably the easiest thing. And this is something that came in some conversations when we were doing the Christmas care packages. Looking at those and, and giving people those to go out and to distribute them in our area, it just kind of hit me like, why don't more of us just have these all the time in our cars? Think about that. Just a seed I want to plant in your heart and in your mind. Can you imagine if we all had a couple, whether it's a you know, sack that had some granola bars, stuff that would just be able to ease a little bit of that burden for that person that we see from time to time, Instead of going, well, I don't really have any change. I don't want to give them a dime. You know, that just seems, you know, insulting. What if we were able to just reach over and say, hey, I've already prepared this and handed it to them? How cool would that be? And how simple is that? But we've got to put these things at the forefront of our thinking. And here's where the challenge gets maybe a little bit more challenging. Because again, as a church often, and it's not wrong, but often we say, hey, next week we're going to have a, a shoe drive. Bring some shoes next week. Uh, often we'll say, hey, you know what? We're going to be doing this or raising this. Come next week prepared. And some of us aren't here every week. Or some of us just use that as an excuse to say, I prayed about it. God wasn't leading. What if right now, right this very second, we responded to a call in one of three ways or in all three ways? I'm going to have our worship director come up here in just a moment. We're going to close in worship. And here's what I'm going to ask you guys to search your hearts and to ask God to truly lead you in this area. Number one, the Bible tells us that if someone is in need of a tunic, which is our outer garment, and we have two, that we should give them that garment. Tells us that if we see someone who's in need, that we should have compassion on that person who's in need. I mean, I look at that jacket. The honest truth is I got six more of them at home. I mean, I, I wonder if, if that was able to be placed into the hands of a, a homeless lady or a homeless man today, what difference it might make in their life. I don't know if you guys noticed, it's stinking cold right now. And there are people today in our community that do not have a place to sleep. They're going to bundle up the best that they can. They're going to make the most out of their bad situation. And we're going to sit here in a heated place, go into our car and drive back to another heated place and climb into our nice, cozy, comfy couch or our bed and go to sleep. I wonder today if you would consider coming up here during this song and leaving your coat today, the one you're wearing. Not only that, as Lyle shared the story of that person not even having shoes. I mean, can you imagine walking around not even having shoes in this cold? What if God would lay it on your heart today to untie your laces and to bring them up at God's altar and say, God, use these and distribute them to someone who's in need. Last but not least, I'm gonna put a little bucket up here, a little yellow bucket. I talked to you guys about the Impact One Fund. If you guys have loose dollars, or if you guys want to donate in any way to poverty this morning, I pray that you guys would honestly consider that. I say this not to bring a burden down in you, but I think as a church that we need to be challenged. I don't know about you. I don't want to play church. I want to be a Christian. I want to be the church. I don't want to show up Sunday after Sunday and sing kumbaya and listen to a good message and feel like I'm doing my Christian duty. This is the equipping place to go out and to be who God has called you to be. Taste and see that the Lord, he is good. 